Good evening and welcome. Hi, my name is Daniel Peabody. I'm a director here at Elizabeth Leach Gallery in Portland, Oregon, and I have with me this evening Ryan Pierce and Charlene Liu. Uh, Ryan Pierce's exhibition, Awake Under Vines, opens this evening, as does Charlene Liu's exhibition, Lattice. Um, we are thrilled to have them both with us here this evening. And um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have questions for either artist uh, or you uh, about a specific painting or about their work in general, please go ahead and ask that question in the comment section and uh, I will pass that question along to the artists. Um, thank you for joining us this evening and uh, we do encourage questions. Um, we'll just jump right in. Ryan, um, tell us about your show. Hi, thanks for um, coming out or in everybody. Um, yeah, this is an exhibition called Awake Under Vines. It's the second in a, in sort of a series of my work that I'm calling Jubilee. And Jubilee is about the confluence of climate chaos due to climate change with the end of industrial capitalism. And it's really positive work. It's about the Bacchanalian mayhem that might ensue as we dismantle the world as it is. Um, and it's, it's messy work. There's a lot of feasts and floods and uh, broken pottery. <laughs> I'm looking to the paintings on the screen for, for clues of what's actually in them. Um, I made this particular, the work that's, that's in this show all in 2020, I believe. Um, so a little, a little faster pace than is usual for me. And that's partly due to the COVID shutdown. Um, as some of you know, I work in the summers as a wilderness educator with the arts organization Signal Fire. And our programs were canceled last year. So I had a really um, hermetic studio summer. And I think it shows in the work, the density of it and some of the um, kind of maddening qualities. The research that went into this work um, is linked to reading I was doing about what other societies did when fascism was on the rise. And so I read a lot of memoirs from the 1930s from people in Italy and France and Germany who were joining the partisans and fighting, fighting the Nazis um, and other fascist groups, either in organized or improvised ways. And you'll see a lot of imagery in these, like in this one, um, a image of a federal police officer um, getting beheaded by a kitchen knife. Um, you'll see a lot of images in these of latent violence and political violence and the cost of political violence on a social level is part of my dialogue in this work. Um, some of the other research I was doing in these was linked to uh, the rise of sort of like the most recent rise of white supremacy in the United States and the organized white power movements. I, reckon I, uh, I recommend the, the book, Bringing the War Home by Kathleen Ballou, which is about how the um, returning violence of the war in Vietnam and the collective trauma and anguish transferred into a culture of white supremacy, particularly in military veterans and, um, and in the police. And we've seen that play out in, um, in the news in the last year, unfortunately. So I think, um, you know, over the last four years, of course, I've been processing what it's like to have the country slip into authoritarianism or pseudo authoritarianism and um, really this reckoning with outright fascism and white supremacy and trying to get a glimpse of hope of like how cultures might respond to that. So some of the imagery also, I think always in my work relates to like cultural resilience and the idea that like the revolution could be fun and burdens and um, wild 
and improvised. So you'll see like in this one, The Fugitive, which is, um, which is inspired by a memoir by an Italian writer named Tommaso Carlotto. Um, you see a lot of like costuming and he writes in his memoir about the time he spent in hiding, uh, you know, after being a political prisoner and escaping. Um, <clears throat> he writes a lot about all the ridiculous disguises he assumed and how he spent so much time underground that he kind of lost track of, of who he was supposed to be. Um, the title Awake Under Vines is something I've had on the back burner for a while. I think it might be a misremembering of how Gulliver's Travels went, but I have this image, like very early image, maybe of reading a children's book version of Gulliver's Travels in which um, maybe Gulliver wakes under the vines of the Lilliputians when he's or Lilliputians, I forget what they're called. Um, but like when he's a giant and there's all these little people that have pinned him under vines. So it's kind of a fairy tale reference to um, a restrictive society, but also to this idea of like a sleeper cell or like a resistance movement that is sort of simmering out of sight and um, kind of ready to rise as soon as the as soon as it throws the shackles off. Um, gardens and gardening tools are a common symbol in this work. This piece that Gwen's highlighting now is called the Waterworks. And that specific piece contains imagery linked to um, some research I found out about um, some Proud Boys or far right activists who work for the city of Portland. One of them works in the Parks and Recreation Department and one of them works in the Water Bureau. Um, and this is widely reported in Portland and Willamette Week and other places. And just thinking about how like city infrastructure can be used to, um, you know, <laughs> to accelerate fascism or, or the opposite of, of that. Um, Several of the pieces in the show have a like kind of a local connection or a connection to real people. It's not all just sort of imagined. Because uh, like the Honey Trap, I think, has some reference to Portland, and um, this one we're looking at, Stormborn Waters, has a name in it as well. J. W. Powell um, in the title, in the uh, subplot of the title. I'm wondering if you want to can you talk a little bit about the kind of local connection on some of these, or yeah. this one is the desert, so it's not local, but connections to the real world. Right, so um, there is a lot of imagery from the desert in Southern Arizona where I spent some of the last year. Um, and there are also some, some local ones. This particular one that we're looking at right now has a, has a partner piece to it that didn't make it into the front gallery. It's back in the stacks and they both, um, they both contain these toppled vessels that are like severed monuments, sculptural heads of like famous, infamous white guys who have been revered by the environmental movement, um, John Wesley Powell, and then the other one, Edward Abbey. And this is a little bit of a link to some past work that I did, which had like the severed heads of conquistadors featured prominently in it. And in this one, um, and as partner, I'm kind of imagining that these guys became like revered and then forgotten. And then their monuments just got like repurposed and desecrated and sort of like sinking back into the land. So they're both desert scapes. They're both people who advocated for um, a depopulated version of the Southwest and that didn't come to pass. I mean, it seems interesting the questioning around who's memorialized and who's uh, you know put on a pedestal, so to speak. It's an interesting conversation in in recent um, recent times. So it's interesting to see you uh, kind of including that in some of your paintings. 
Right. And there's John Muir in the corner of that painting. He's a, that's the head of John Muir made into a house planter that it has a redwood sapling growing out of it and then it's been shattered. So kind of these, um, you know, lions of the white male environmental movement um, and sort of imagining that they've been uh, not only kind of deplatformed, but like entirely forgotten and erased. It seems like one of the things I find really curious, I've seen you do this in past bodies of work too, but in this show, uh, many of the works have um, some sort of uh, object that seems like mechanical. Like I think in this one, it's sort of like a mechanical hand uh, that would be plugged in. And then there's like another one where there's like a cantaloupe that seems to potentially have like a timer attached to it. Um, in a previous show, I know you had like a potato that was been turned into a balm. Um, I feel like there was a cake that also has wires in it. Talk to me a little bit about that imagery. The remote control cake. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, imagery that refers to um, sort of like improvised bombs or, you know, and, and it's like pretty farcical. Like in this one, it's just a box of potatoes on the left side. And if you look closely, there's like a timer stuck in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for looking closely. And um, in another one, it's like, it's like a cake that is obviously rigged up with wires that nobody would ever think was a normal looking cake. Um, and that's in my work, that's kind of like uh, part of my vocabulary ar around subterfuge and resistance. And I think I got that from reading um, um, Mario Vargas Llosa, the Peruvian writer who writes a lot about um, political resistance in Peru and, and not in a fantastical way, in a very, um, you know, auto fictional way. Um, and yeah, and then in other cases, there's just sort of like pitchforks and rakes and kind of like the tools of resistance that are at hand, but not always tools of violence, often tools of regeneration or celebration. So one of the other things that strikes me really strongly about this particular body of work um, is um, uh, has to not not this, particular, not this particular painting, but this body of work is there. Um, there's a lot of like really like interesting transparent layering, and I know a little bit about how you physically make your work with masking and layering. But can you talk a little bit about that? That uh, it's not the camera is not picking up quite as much as you see it in real life, mm -hmm. but um, but can you talk a little bit about that? Because that feels like a little bit of a shift with this particular show. Yeah, I think. Um... I realized how many more layers I could involve in the work. And the, the pink one that Gwen's pointing out is a good example. Um, I'm able to do more masking using little kind of bits of spray paint mist. And if you're able to, I encourage you to see the work in person because um, a lot of the paint is metallic and as you see there, so like it really changes and some of it is almost invisible from one angle and then it pops out and becomes, um, you know, a, a presence or an object in the painting. And so that allows me to kind of superimpose and really access maybe like the shadowy or like rumored aspect of the contents of this work. You know, I've said this before and I, I but I keep coming, I come, keep, always come back to it when I look at your work. Um, you talk a lot about how the work is inspired by um, the end of kind of the kind of end of one system or cycle of what the way we sort of function on the planet as human beings as a society. Um, but you know, it's like um, it's not. Um, I mean, some people might term it as sort of apocalyptic, but it's not apocalyptic because you really view the end of that as sort of like a regenerative or a rebirth. Um, and I think you bring like a level of optimism to the notions around climate change and sort of the shifting of society that will have to take place potentially uh, if we don't make changes now in the future, the changes will be more dramatic. Um, but there's something about, I, I once said about your work that I feel like the end of the world never looked so good. And um, it, there's just something really sort of celebratory about 
the the colored palette and the, the kind of cacophony of of the imagery. Um, there's also seems to be this really uh, interesting play between kind of like beauty and mess, and you're kind of finding beauty in you know in kind of uh, kind of uh, chaos or a mess. Do you want to? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, for folks who've never seen any of my work before. Um, I think for you know almost 20 years now, I've been making work that attempts to portray sort of like a near future and the consequences of climate change. And the world has like really caught up with my project, unfortunately. And it started out looking, I think, rather sci-fi and this kind of experiment with like, how would people re-inhabit a, a world that's just, you know, suffered like what you might call an apocalyptic climate disaster. And I think I've tried to disengage with that notion of the apocalypse, like you mentioned, Daniel, because it's such a, um, it's such magical thinking. And, and I really want to work from a place of anti-apocalypse that is like uh, looking to the resilience of human communities and um, the hope that we can move to a closer knowledge of the natural world. And so now it's no longer such a future world. It looks, you know, in some cases, a lot like something that could happen today. And, um, you know, the mess is like, is the adjustment for me. And there's just kind of like a lot of stuff left <laughs> around in this world because we we spent you know, the industrial revolution making so much stuff. And now we have to kind of like fix it and repurpose it and keep it around um, so that it'll, it'll serve us in, in this time as we, as we change how we inhabit the planet. Well, they're really incredible paintings. And I do encourage people to come and see them in person. The, the, um, the richness of the layering and the color just is not quite, um, fully appreciate, you can't fully appreciate it through through the kind of uh, video um, that we're able to show over the streaming, but um, it's a really great body of work and I really am excited about opening the show with it. Um, um, I'm just gonna, we'll do a little, little quick transition here, but Ryan, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate it. Uh, if people are, um, who are joining us on, um, stream, um, uh, live stream, please go ahead and feel free to ask any questions or share comments in the comment section. Um, I'm Daniel Peabody, I'm a director here at Elizabeth Beach Gallery, and I was just talking with Ryan Pierce about his exhibition, Awake Under Vines, which is uh, just opening tonight, April 1st, and on view through uh, May 29th. Um, and now we're gonna chat with Charlene Liu, uh, who has the exhibition Lattice up, which you're now seeing on the screen. Um, of watercolors and woodblock prints. Um, and Charlene, welcome. Thank you. It's great hearing you talk about the work, Ryan. And I'll just I'll just talk really briefly about the the two works, watercolors and woodcuts I have in this show. And I think that both of them share, even though they are different mediums, they share a lot in common. The woodcuts are the watercolors actually since we're here are um, done in plain air. And they and the ones I selected for the show are the ones probably from May when everything was blooming towards right before the wildfires. Um, there were there were other watercolors too, but this is the one I selected to go with the woodcuts. And for, for me, they're very immediate. So I make them in plain air with no preparatory drawing. I'm just in a moment painting and responding and dealing with the lights shifting and conditions changing around me. I keep it pretty simple. So I take a sheet of paper, some watercolors and maybe three brushes and sit on the grass or a little stool. And it was really, I think, partly in response to, to just the context of, uh, of everything being closed down 
having young kids at home with me and also having a very full-time job on top of it. And I wanted to return to a practice that was a little bit faster, more fluid, and that was also very, um, very, had a lot of pleasure in it. So I could, and also because I was, I, I literally went nowhere except in my yard. And so we would hang out in the garden together and I would paint and my kids would play along with me. And I was just really looking closely at what I was, what was in front of me and mostly weeds and wildflowers. And it, I, I will say that it's a very selective viewpoint because I'm actually quite a terrible gardener. And so it's really like the corner in the garden that actually had some stuff growing <laughs> that I could take a look at. Um, and it was really, I also really love color and I love the abstraction of watercolor, how it's a very fluid medium. It has a lot of color, it's very transparent. I could layer and that a brush marker line that actually almost looks like nothing could come together and become a flower or plant or a butterfly or a tree or a person, anything. That And I love that, that flip between the abstract and sort of a more descriptive space. The wood, cuts is a is a sort of longer going project that maybe I started investing and in heavily in maybe late 2019 and is sort of ongoing and these are they're all unique prints so and they're all modular wood blocks so all the blocks are are individual wood cuts that I would put together and compose in a press and they really span a a wide wider range of references so some of them may be motifs that I take from like it, mainly East Asian decorative art objects or historical art objects, and also um, nature references and imagery, again, from my garden or my yard or around my house. And I would draw them and redraw them and really break them down into a very, very simple form. And they would, they're then um, cut by machine. So there's no hand cutting here with exception of one wood cut. And I'll take all of these uh, multiple blocks and I also mix a lot of color. So I have, I also spend a lot of time color mixing a very wide palette. But then when I go into the print shop, I narrow it down to um, maybe the particular set of shapes I want to work with and the particular color palette I'm interested in. And once I'm on the press, it's all about improvising. So I'm inking, improvising again, really in the moment, similar to the woodcuts. Uh, but way more, way more set up for printmaking. And I think for anyone that is a printmaker, they'll understand what that means. But on the press, it's really, again, all about being in the moment, about responding to um, what's happening in front of me. A lot of layering and transparent layering of colors and ghosting of prints, so, which means it's the secondary or third impression. And each one has less and less ink on it. And I think um, the ones I selected for the show, again, are the ones with the strongest nature or garden imagery to pair to go with watercolors they um i really really love this project because the shapes are quite simple but as i as i um keep printing i always hit this wall and i think i don't know like how, how what what else can i do with a flower shape like how many like and i think there's something really interesting there where you think you can't come up with anything more but you sort of break through and you see all these other possibilities in front of you. And so here, I, I don't know, probably a music, music analogy is the best. I have my tools or my instrument and I, which is the press and the blocks. I have like this, my color palette. And then there is just sort of responding and riffing and doing many, many variations. The some of the more recent woodcuts that are that are part of this project, actually the there's still the same, many of the same blocks, but maybe the, the more cultural references are stronger because of the way I, I put them together for, and it's less garden-like or nature imagery. And I also love that same way, this idea of abstraction and illustration and how I can take these similar blocks and in one, one print, it could look like a garden and another print, it could look like, um, uh, I don't know, like a, old school video game or something, which is actually <laughs> this other series I was playing around with. This one that we're looking at right now is the one hand cut wood cut that I put in the show. And it was sort of a tangential, um, actually just another project that I'm sort of playing around with on the side where I draw directly on a block with the Sumi ink or on paper. And then I really try to cut the block 
as closely to the ink drawing as possible, even picking up some of the way the line is fuzzy on the paper. And I put this in here because the, the imagery is actually, again, similar to some of the watercolors. Um, and I, and it's also very abstract and illustrative at the same time. So I would say both the watercolors and woodcuts share a very similar space of, of, um, and, and of being immediate and in the moment of being somewhat improvisational and also uh, additive, you know, nothing, he once it goes down, it goes down, it stays. I cannot erase anything and don't erase anything. So I sort of have to embrace whatever happens. And Lattice, the title refers to both the guard, the idea of the garden imagery. And I love that actually that your paintings have a lot of lattice work in it in the front room. But it also is a reference to the idea of the grid or the screen, which is really how the woodcuts and the press, those are sort of the conditions in which I make the woodcut work. Um, I love color and I love the, I think they're quite very much about intimacy and about joy. And I feel that I could, I would, would describe the work and really my goal in that space. I'm really interested in, um, in a very, uh, right now, as much as possible, a very joyful expression through my work and of a very, embracing a very, embracing immediacy and fluidity and being able to uh, roll or improvise in the moment. Thank you, Charlene. That's fantastic kind of tour through your show, uh, Lattice. Um, it is really amazing how, you know, you're with both bodies of work that are kind of make up the exhibition, both the watercolors and the wood blocks, there's this incredible uh, amount of layering um, and this really rich uh, color palette. Um, there's a few of the watercolors actually just to the, to the right of the one we're looking at that are kind of this sort of tangle of, uh, of imagery, um, a, a plan imagery and kind of abstract imagery. And they, in many ways, you know, feel so much like the layering of the, of the wood blocks. And they also really, I think, having, you know, worked with you for a number of years, uh, as well, uh, harken back to some of your early work with lots of collage and layering of print, print um, mm -hmm. uh, techniques in it. Um, they're really quite quite beautiful. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting about the wood blocks is this really interesting um, play of positive and negative. I feel like you're taking these really foundational sort of uh, tools in an artist's toolbox and you're really pushing them, uh, you know, with mastery, but really pushing them to an ex, you know, kind of an extreme. Um, uh, I think it's most evident, and actually, the ones kind of opposite the ones we're looking at right now, the kind of pink one and the green one. But there's, you know, there's there's uh, kind of a diamond motif, which is like the negative space be, uh, um, between circles. Like if you put a grid of circles together, there'd be kind of a diamond shape in between. Um, but then, so you're layering like in these two, you're layering, or especially the one on the left, the pink one you're layering like these diamond motifs, but you're also then layering kind of grids of circles. And it's this really interesting thing where you're seeing both a positive and a negative mm -hmm. uh, image layered. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how layer, what, what layer, what role layering plays in the process? Well, I feel like you definitely saw one of the main things here, which is, I feel like in a lot of my work, I'm always sort of interested in destabilizing the space or confusing the foreground and background and playing with negative and positive. And this is also very directly linked to the process or the making of the work. The once I serve along, once I draw the shapes, which is all done by hand, they do get scanned and I actually cr create a pattern. And I always try to maximize the block. So the use of the positive and negatives are always, uh, some some end goal. And once they get cut, and also it's, a, it's about finding a design a pattern in which I can maximize the block and the way that they can expand in different ways. And that I would might be able to use every single moment from the negative to the positive and be able to really create a, a wider, not necessarily infinite, but a wider variation of possibilities because then off the grid. And so there's always a play between, in some ways, the, the rigidity 
or the context of the grid and the screen from the from the digital fabrication and digital software to the press. And then what I can do really um, through Im improvising and through just, you know, my my work in my hand. Um, and in this in this space, you know, hand not meaning like I'm making a mark, but hand on how I sort of compose and lay things together. And you'll see that um, some of them are, I just like how everything gets quite wobbly, <laughs> but they're also very rigid at the same time. And I also do like that sometimes I might be able to find, you know, I might design something just like circles in a line, but then I might find a space where they can come together and become a flower or an eye or um, another shape. That was a total accident. I feel like I didn't know that that was going to um, look that way, like the eye, and I love the accidental possibilities of layering. So layering really for me is also about chance, chance operations, accidents. Some of them I really do have some sense of how it's gonna go and some of them are unplanned and then I keep building off of that. The colors are always transparent because between the first and second and third impressions and the way that I mix the colors, again, for those, the, I mean, you can't, woodcut is so beautiful, just the flatness of that color. And it's very different from a screen print because it embosses into the paper. And there's something that's so um, so tactile and so haptic about woodcut. And it's one of the most ancient printmaking forms. And I just love, um, love that continuum. Well, it is really interesting that you're taking, you know, you just said that woodcut is one of the most, you know, um, you know, one of, the, one of the most rudimentary, not rudimentary, but one of the earliest forms of printing, right? Uh, and you're, but you're also using a lot of technology. I mean, I think you you yes. came out of the, if I recall correctly, you came out of the sort of printmaking school at Columbia, and there's a lot of, um, you know, it was a lot of uh, kind of inventiveness, kind of an unconventional approach to printmaking. Um, another artist, uh, you were in school with another one of the artists we work with, Nicola Lopez, who also kind of brings that kind of unconventional approach to printmaking. Um, I love the way you're marrying like, kind of like new technologies and new possibilities and new approaches because you're not doing additions, you're doing unique works for the most part, um, but using uh, technology designed for, for multiples. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, just kind of the kind of how you mix um, kind of traditional or old school techniques with kind of new techniques and, mm -hmm. and why, why, you know, I mean, these are fantastic and um, really uh, rich and uh, enjoyable to look at. Um, but I also, you're kind of making a decision to make just one unique piece where, versus, uh, you know, an addition of 10 or something. Can you talk a little bit about those choices? Yeah, you know, when I teach, sometimes I actually give a lecture on the history of printmaking and it really is talking about technology and evolution of technology from ancient print to now. So in that way, I think it's, um, it is a very, sort of natural, if you will, um, progression or the logic is 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 always there. Um, and I think that yeah, Columbia was definitely influenced because there is a uh, sort of a teaching professional shop and a big offset press and everything we did was was often many of the things we did was quite experimental and large scale. I don't know why we had to make everything big, but it actually gets more complicated as it gets big. And I think there's, for me, I've always been really interested in the particular tradition in printmaking, which is taking some of the technology and sort of that history of, you know, text in the printing press and ability to create multiples. But really, instead of thinking about multiples as an additioning, thinking about it in terms of the aesthetics of like multiplicity, you know, that I could create modular blocks that could fit together in different ways, I could layer them, that I could play around using like all using a matrix and the technology and a machine, both the mechanical and the digital machines, that I could create almost like in, infinite variations is quite, you know, humanistic like a very human touch and that can be quite intimate even you know when it's large scale and i also um just love the the um i have to say i kind of i have really used to hate this but now i really love the the almost strict rules that printmaking imposes on you through its process and really kind of struggling or fighting against it and finding my work through that space which i will have to say is also um how I ended up in watercolor was actually, I remember I left grad school and <laughs> I was very exhausted from printmaking <laughs> and I wanted something that um, 
that I could do, you know, at a kitchen table or at my desk, wherever I was, and that was much less um, arduous in terms of this process. And actually, so there's the history of watercolor for me that's actually quite connected to printmaking. And now I have them both in the show together. I love it. Well, it's a really wonderful show. Um, I hope uh, many people who are watching now will come in and see them in person as well as through um, through this this evening. Um, again, I'm Daniel Peabody. I'm the director here at Elizabeth Leach Gallery, and I'm talking with Charlene Liu and Ryan Pierce about their current exhibitions at the gallery. Um, Ryan's exhibition is Wake Under Vines, and Charlene's is Lattice, and both of the exhibitions are on view April 1st through um, May 29th. So uh, with um, COVID, we're running our shows a little longer, so please uh, give people more time to come in. Our, we're currently uh, open Tuesday through Saturday, 10.30 to 5.30 um, by appointment or a knock at the door. So uh, please do come by and see both of these shows in person. Um, if anyone's watching and has a question uh, or a comment they'd like to share, please go ahead and put that in the comment box. Um, just I'll ask one or two last questions, and then if we get any um, any more questions from the audience, we do have a few comments, but if we get any more questions from the audience, um, I will pass those along. Um, both of you have recently, had fairly recently been in kind of a, kind of a biennial or a triennial or something like that. Do you, um, can you talk a little bit about that experience? Ryan, you were in the Portland Art Museum's, um, the map is not the territory triennial of Northwest art. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, what that experience was like for you um, in terms of uh, showing your work in the in kind of a larger group context and how that kind of, you know, what, what you learned through that process and how it kind of feeds your studio practice. And Charlene, of course, you were in the, um, uh, Portland Biennial in, in 2016, uh, hosted by the Stecta that Michelle Grabner curated. Uh, maybe you can each take a turn to talk a little bit about your experience with that and uh, how it relates to your practice in general. Ryan, maybe you can go first. Sure. Um, well, I, I want to um, sidestep the question for a second and just say that like, I was really excited when I learned that I was going to get to show with Charlene because I feel like we have a a common interest in visual pleasure. Yes. It just really activates, you know, or contextualizes my own work in a way that I find delightful and um, just really, it's, it's, it's awesome proximity. And I think that, you know, for anybody out there in uh, TV land, like, and I miss you, and this is weird to do, I want to acknowledge that it's weird to do like a YouTube opening and also to just say um thank you for for the support and getting through the last year and i feel like um even though it's kind of hermetic studio work it, it happens with a network of support and i'm i'm really grateful to my family and my my housemates at my current house and my last one and to sadie wexler and amy harwood for your continued support um, to my Signal Fire family and also to Elizabeth Leach Gallery for continuing to believe in this work and give me such a beautiful venue to, to share it in. So I just wanted to kind of take a, a little moment to express gratitude for, um, you know, the everything that supported me in, in making this work. And thinking about the map is not the territory, which is a group exhibition um as daniel said at the at the portland art museum um that was a special experience both to be in that venue and um i got to work with uh the curator grace cook anderson who i just think is so brilliant and doing wonderful things at the portland art museum and um grace has been familiar with my work for many years because we lived in san francisco together and um so it felt like just uh a natural expression of her belief in in my work over a long term and um it you know group group shows are always funny because you <laughs> you are at the at the whim of someone else's vision for how your work relates in some ways but it also like reveals things to you about how your work reflects on other 
folks next to you. And I, I made some friends through the show and um, I don't know what to say other than it was quite an honor. And I'll pass it over to Charlene. Um, the, the Portland Biennial, you know, I think um, it was actually quite a, a it, it was quite a pivotal moment for me. And I think that Michelle Grabner had a particular vision and sent me out to Pendleton, which was very, very far away. My kids were even younger then. And I kept thinking, I, I don't really know like, what I think about this, but I ended up showing work at Curl Shadow and made that connection. I thought it was really brilliant that she thought about that site for me because it was really amazing to meet the people at Curl Shadow and to see the work that they're doing. And through that, you know, I got to know the work of Wendy Red Star invited her down to university and also got to see visit a studio of Jim Labrador and see his amazing work. So the connections were quite amazing in that way, getting to know Oregon and Oregon artists a little bit more. And also she gave me the opportunity to uh, tr make an installation piece, which I did in the in the Rivoli Theater. And that work was more directly about my biography and my mother's, um, our family Chinese American restaurant and the history of Chinese immigrants in the US. And I think, um, and I've never really, I, you know, I thought of it as a print too in, in the methodology and it was really very project managed in that way, which is quite great. And it was the first time that I actually um, thought three dimensionally and tapped so directly into the East Asian theme and also my biography. And it's really, and really great because it led to a a collaborative video I made with my family, and also there's going to be another iteration of it of the of the um, restaurant installation piece in another show coming up in a couple of years, and so that's sort of going on in the in the background. And I and I also feel like I don't really couldn't describe it right now, but I know somehow it really led to, in particular, the woodcuts. Something about thinking about print in a different way and thinking about scale. Um, I just became very invested in printmaking and all the possibilities there. Uh, I also want to say similar to what you just brought up, which is thank you to, this is weird <laughs> to like see my, I'm actually seeing my own work digitally. <laughs> like what is this thing? And I also really want to thank the gallery for, um, for being so, so connected to, or to their artists in Oregon too. And I think that really, like I felt like in the past couple of years, it's sort of be, because my job was quite demanding. I felt like I was just kind of making work on the side, not really thinking about showing or anything else. And it's always, you know, it's always like Elizabeth, like sending me some random email and being like, I'm going to pop by your backyard and look at your work. And I said, really? <laughs> that, that then something happens. And I really think as an artist, I truly appreciate that. And it's really great to show with you, Ryan, because I feel like I don't, I couldn't imagine a better pairing right now. I feel like there's so many connections in the work. And I really respond to what you said about being anti-apocalypse apocalypse, because I do think in, in my earlier work too, it was much more fantastical and much more imaginative, fantastical imagery. And frankly, nothing here right now is, it might not seem like it, but it's actually quite observed, you know, observed of what's in front of me right now, even if it has some of the same same qualities as my older work. It feels very timely for spring, this show, and yeah. you know, we can only thank the, the gallery staff's foresight for that scheduling. Yes, that too. <laughs> well, we do our best. And we, uh, we love being connected with both of you um, on behalf of myself and Elizabeth and the whole gallery team. Um, it's a pleasure to work with you both. Um, thank you for the um, really beautiful exhibitions and, and really poignant exhibitions. I hope people will come in and spend some time with them uh, as well as look at them online. Um, I think we're kind of running out of time a little bit here, but um, we're kind of right on target to, for our planned time frame. But there are some great comments. Um, I don't see any questions in the in the comment section, but I do see some really positive um Congratulations from a number of folks. Um, so I want to encourage both of the artists before you uh, log off, please click out, make sure you click over to the comment bar if you're not uh, on it to um, uh, um, to make sure you see the see the congratulations from a number of folks. 
Um, and it's great to have you both join us, one of you from Portland, one of you from Eugene. And um, I look forward to seeing you both here in person in the gallery, which I've been able to see Ryan's already. But uh, Charlene, I look forward to you coming up and seeing the show in person as well <laughs> yes. during the show. Um, and I look forward to the audience coming in and seeing the, the um, exhibitions in person. We are, um, we're not doing openings yet because of we still can't do crowds, but uh, we are welcoming in a handful of people at a time, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 10.30 to 5.30, um, face mask required. So um, anyway, uh, thank you both. Um, do, do either of you have any last comments or, or um, uh, or anything like that before we sign off. Just thanks for joining us, folks. Yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I just w also want to say thank you to everyone and thank both of the artists, uh, Ryan and Charlene, for the great work and for taking the time to do a virtual opening with us this evening. So come by Elizabeth Leach Gallery in person and look online and check out the shows. Thank you both. Congratulations. <laughs>